Tonight, we're going to talk about pediatric brain tumors. And personally, this is a subject I love, despite the fact that uh, we are dealing with very bad pathology. Well, some of these tumors are benign, but all in all, very severe pathology in young children. But from a radiological point of view, these are quite fascinating tumors and is a very interesting topic. So you all know my approach by now. I believe when dealing with a brain tumor, I ask myself three questions. How old is the patient? Where is the tumor located? And the last question, and the one I consider the least important, is what does the tumor look like on imaging? The question, how old is the patient? Well, we are now dealing with pediatric tumor, so the patient is a child. But even when we are talking about pediatric brain tumors, we're going to see that the kind of tumors we see in very young children, like infants and toddlers, are different from the tumors we see in school-age children, which are different from tumors we see in teenagers and adolescents. So age is still important. So we have different kinds of children. So like I said, here we have four broad categories, infants and toddlers, school-age kids, teenagers, and young adults or adolescents. So what is the spectrum of brain tumors we might encounter in children? Well, totally different compared to that in adults. Metastasis, the most frequent brain tumor in adults, is very exceptional in, ch in uh, children. It's maybe 1%, 1.5% of brain tumors in children. And when children have brain metastasis, in the majority of cases, the primary is neuroblastoma. In children, we rarely see metastasis, and we have the following spectrum, like about half of primary brain tumors in children are gliomas or glial tumors. Glial tumors are also an important group of primary brain tumors in adults, but the kind of tumors we see in children is not the same as the gliomas we see in adults. Like in adults, you have glioblastoma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma. These tumors are not seen in children. In children, we see tumors like pilocytic astrocytoma, which is the most frequent glioma and also the most frequent cerebellar tumor in children. This is a circumscribed glioma. A circumscribed glioma is generally a benign glioma that has very sharp borders, um, bordering it from the brain parenchyma. Then we have the group of the diffuse pediatric gliomas. The diffuse gliomas are gliomas that infiltrate the brain parenchyma. And these are more difficult to treat because the tumor is so infiltrative, it's difficult or more difficult for the surgeon to become a complete curative resection. And in uh, children, we have different diffuse gliomas as in adults, and these tumors tend to have very weird names. See, they are generally called by their molecular features. And that's why they have names like H3K27 altered midline glioma, just to name one. Uh, that is a high-grade glioma, so we can make a distinction between high-grade and low-grade gliomas in children. And about 60% of pediatric high-grade gliomas are located in the brain stem. Another important difference from adults. In adults, the most frequent malignant glioma is glioblastoma, and glioblastomas rarely occur in the brainstem or in the cerebellum. Then we have the pituitary tumors and craniopharyngiomas, or a tumor type also found in adults, but in children, it's the most frequent cellular tumor. And this is not completely correct, but you have the impression here that it's only a small part of the pituitary tumors, but it's basically at least the half of cellular tumors or craniopharyngiomas in children. Then another important group that is less frequently seen in adults, these can occur in adults, but are infrequent, are the embryonal tumors. And the embryonal tumors make up about 10% of pediatric brain tumors, and they are very malignant tumors, highly aggressive. 
And the most important one of this group is the medulloblastoma. And then we have a whole bunch of various tumors. Notice that meningeal tumors like meningioma are infrequent in children, uh, contrary to adults. And we have some tumor types that are very typical for children, like germ cell tumors. Germ cell tumors are classic pediatric tumors. Choroid plexus tumors, too. These are tumors that can also occur in adults, but in the majority of cases, they are found in children. So now you have an overview. Let's get started. Uh, we already have age, children, okay? That's the age category. How about location? In this presentation, I'm going to talk about pediatric brain tumors based on location. I'm going to start with tumors located intratentorially, like in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Then I'm going to talk about supratentorial brain tumors. And I'm going to make a distinction between tumors located in the hemispheres of the brain and midline tumors. And midline tumors are tumors that are, that are found in very small anatomic regions, like the pituitary region and the region of the optic chiasm and hypothalamus and the pineal gland. And despite the fact that these regions are small, a lot of brain tumors are found there. So we're going to spend some time discussing those. Let's start with infratentorial pediatric brain tumors. So when we're talking about the infratentorial structures, we can subdivide these even more into the cerebellum, the cerebellum rather, the brainstem, and the fourth ventricle. Let's get started by jumping immediately into a case. And this is an old mini case, right? What do we see on these images? We see a tumor located in the right cerebellar hemisphere, and the tumor is composed of two components. We have a large cyst located posteriorly, and then we have an enhancing nodule, a large enhancing nodule. And this combination, a tumor consisting of an enhancing nodule and a large cyst in the cerebellum and the cerebellum of a child is basically pathognomonic for pilocytic astrocytoma. Pilocytic astrocytoma is a benign tumor. It's a WHO grade one tumor. It belongs to the group of the circumscribed, circumscribed glial tumors and is the most frequent cerebellar tumor in children. The tumor can also be found in adults, but it's less frequent than adults. And when it is found in adults, it tends to be located supratentorially. The majority of patients are children and young adults, and about three quarters of the tumors are found in patients younger than 20, with a peak incidence of school aged children and young teenagers between 5 and 15 years old. So, pilocytic astrocytomas are most frequent in the cerebellum, but that's not the only place where we can find them. So we are going to encounter pilocytic astrocytomas when we discuss hemispheric uh, tumors as well, for instance. About 60% are found in the cerebellum. Then we have about 25 to 30%, which are found in the midline, more specifically in the region of the optic pathways, like the optic chiasm, uh, and the hypothalamus. Then we have some tumors that are located in the brainstem, and pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem are mostly found in the mesencephalon and the medulla oblongata. And then we have tumors located in the cerebral hemispheres. These are not frequent, and when you have a pilocytic astrocytoma, supratentorially, chances are high that the patient is older. When you see them in adults, they are generally located in the cerebral hemispheres. But let's go back to the cerebellum because we're now talking about infratentorial pediatric brain tumors. These are all pilocytic astrocytomas and each and every one of them has this old mini appearance. They can be a bit variable, but we can each and every time see a large cyst and a nodule component that is enhancing. This is a P2-weighted image, so we can't talk about enhancement here. These are also P2-weighted images. And then we have here, once again, T1-weighted images with gadolinium. 
but it's that's not the only appearance a pilocytic astrocytoma can have. So here we have the typical pilocytic astrocytoma and another one, but here we see that the tumor is mainly solid because the component is already a lot smaller. So there can be a lot of variability in the size of the nodular versus the cystic component. Here we have a large nodular component surrounded by cystic components, and these tumors were located in the hemispheres. This is a midline tumor located in the vermis. Also notice that here we have some faint enhancement of the cyst wall. The cyst wall of a pilocytic astrocytoma may enhance or may not enhance. Everything is possible. Here we also have a pilocytic astrocytoma, but the tumor is uh, predominantly solid. We don't see cysts surrounding the tumor. And then we have here a completely solid mass, hyperintensity, two rated images without any enhancement or maybe very faint enhancement. So basically, the appearance is more heterogeneous or can be more heterogeneous than just the cyst with nodule. So keep that in mind because it is still the most frequent tumor in the cerebellum and children. Take this young boy, for instance, 11 months old, so that's very young, and you have this. When you look at these sensitivity one rated images with gadolinium, you see a very ugly tumor. When you open these images, your first reflex is, oh my God, and that's why I called it an oh my God tumor. What's going on here? This looks very infiltrative and very aggressive. Would you agree when you see this? Let's look at some other images. These are the detubated images. Here, it seems to be a very sharp circumscribed, circumscribed tumor, completely solid with some cystic central components and with heterogeneous enhancement. This too, what? A pilocytic astrocytoma. So, my message here is pilocytic astrocytoma should, should basically be the first thing you think about when you're seeing a pediatric fossa posterior tumor located in the cerebellar hemispheres or in the vermis. You should think it is pilocytic astrocytoma. And when should you think something else? Well, let's start with another tumor. This is another tumor. This is a young child with, um, with the hydrocephalus. Obviously, we see widening of the distance between the frontal horns. We see widening of the temporal horn. And then we see here a large mass, which appears to be located in the fourth ventricle. The mass is surrounded by small cysts. So you could wonder if this is too a pilocytic astrocytoma. So what do we have? Hydrocephalus and a mass in the fourth ventricle. Then let's look at some other images. These are the sagittal T1-weighted images with gadolinium, axial T1-weighted images with gadolinium, a T2 star, which shows some either microhemorrhages or calcifications. We can't say that for sure, only on T2 star. And then most conspicuous, these are the diffusion images. Here we have the diffusion images and here the ADC map, we see that the tumor is hyper intense on diffusion images and dark on the ADC map. This finding is something you have to uh, keep in mind or take note of. This is the hallmark of a medulloblastoma. So when you see a tumor located in the posterior fossa, not just in the fourth ventricle, as you will see later on, but in the posterior fossa with diffusion restriction, think medulloblastoma. But first of all, ah, and let's compare. This is our patient with a pilocytic astrocytoma. This was the young patient with the, oh my God, humor. What is this? It looks aggressive, but it was a pilocytic astrocytoma. And what do we see? A heterogeneous mass, completely solid, with no diffusion restriction whatsoever. Let's compare that with the medulloblastoma. Here we see an enhancing mass, some cystic components in the periphery, and diffusion restriction. So, pilocytic astrocytomas are located in the cerebellar parenchyma and have no diffusion restriction. Medulloblastomas or the classical textbook cases, located in the fourth ventricle and have diffusion restriction. Okay, 
what can we tell about medulloblastomas? Well, I already told you it's a very malignant tumor. The tumor belongs to the group of the embryonal tumors, and embryonal tumors are tumors that are derived from embryonal cells that undergo malignant transformation. They are always WHO4 tumors. Medulloblastoma is the most frequent malignant pediatric brain tumor. So also take note of that because you will encounter this tumor in daily practice. They can occur at all ages, but the majority are found in children. 80% are found in patients under 17, and the median age is about six. So let's say toddlers and school age children. And we have four molecular subtypes, and that is not unimportant, as you will see, because these subtypes tend to have preferential locations and preferential age groups. But first thing first, let's start with the classical medulloblastoma. Uh, this is another patient. Segment T1 where the images with gadolinium show us avidly enhancing mass located or with the epicenter in the fourth ventricle. Now, these tumors do not arise in the fourth ventricle because there's nothing there. They arise from the cerebellum, but from the superficial layers of the anterior vermes and then extend into the fourth ventricle. This tumor is rather heterogeneous on T2, has some cystic components in the periphery, and most conspicuous, most important, is diffusion restrictive. So why is the tumor diffusion restrictive? Because it belongs to a group of tumors called the small blue round cell tumors. I told you about those in the previous session, but for the people who couldn't attend them, the small blue round cell tumors are a heterogeneous group of tumors that are characterized by the fact that they are composed of very small cells that are very uh, compactly organized in the tumor matrix. And as a consequence, the intercellular spaces are very narrow. That's why diffusion of water molecules is limited and these tumors tend to have diffusion restriction. So medulloblastoma belongs to these tumors, but uh, lymphomas do as well, Ewing sarcoma does too, pineoblastomas. So that's the, the only thing these tumors have in common is the way they look like when you look at them through a microscope, composed out of a lot of very small cells. Now, let's talk a bit more about these medulloblastoma subtypes, because medulloblastoma is more than the classical textbook midline fourth ventricle tumor we see here. We have four subtypes based on differing molecular characteristics. We have the wingless type, WNT, the sonic hedgehog type, SHH, and then we have group three and group four. These correspond for the biggest part to the classic midline fourth ventricle tumor. And these have no defined molecular features yet. Uh, let's talk a bit more about the other two, the wingless type and sonic hedgehog. In this patient, I can't remember the age, but we see a tumor located in the region of the cerebellopontine angle and the right middle uh, cerebellar peduncle. This tumor, which contains a large cystic component of T2, clearly has increased signal on diffusion images associated with low signal ADC, so that's diffusion restriction, and is enhancing with the exception of the cystic component. This is the typical location for a WNT wingless subtype medulloblastoma. And the wingless subtype medulloblastoma is a type of medulloblastoma that is found in children, but can also occur in adults. And there is something good about it. If you have to have a medulloblastoma, then that's the best one you can have. This one has the best prognosis. So the typical location for these tumors is the region of the Lushka foramen or cerebellopontine region, as we can see here. Um, and how do we explain that location? Because the wingless subtype is basically derived from precursor cells for the brainstem. And these cells tend to migrate 
from the anterior vernis to the brainstem in a trajectory that more or less goes uh, along the undersurface of the middle cerebellar peduncle to the Lushka, uh, Lushka foramen, okay? the foramen of Lushka. And when some of these cells remain stuck here some way along the way and undergo malignant transformation, we get the development of a wingless subtype medulloblastoma. So the Lushka region is the preferential location, but these cells originate from here, so they can also be located, just to make it difficult, they can also be located along the midline in the fourth ventricle. So don't be surprised if your pathologist tells you that a midline fourth ventricle tumor is uh, a wingless subtype. It is possible. However, if you see a medulloblastoma here, it won't be a group three or group four tumor. It will very likely be a wingless subtype. So oh, I'm going to use some PowerPoint tools. And here we see the tumor on diffusion and diffusion restriction. Let's go to the second subtype, the sonic hedgehog subtype. Sonic, sonic hedgehog subtype medulloblastomas are found in the cerebellar hemispheres. Here we see on the two weighted images a heterogeneous tumor containing a lot of very small cysts, no enhancement, or maybe very faint, and then diffusion restriction like you wouldn't believe. So there are a lot of people that when, a good, uh, when talking about brain tumors, I think contrast enhancement is the most important sequence or the most important thing in the differential diagnosis of brain tumors. Uh, I disagree. I believe, especially when we're talking about pediatric brain tumors, the most useful sequence you can have is probably for differential diagnosis, the diffusion weighted images. So this is the sonic, sonic hedgehog subtype, which is found in the cerebellar hemispheres, cerebellar hemispheres rather. And these are two different patients. Uh, they both have sonic, sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas. And when we compare the tumors, we see that they both have very conspicuous diffusion restriction, but tumor one is not contrast enhancing or barely contrast enhancing. Tumor two is very enhancing. So basically the contrast sequences don't help us. The most useful sequence here was the diffusion weighted sequence. The sonic, sonic hedgehog subtype medulloblastoma is not frequently found in children, but more in infants. So very, very, very young children, less than one year of age and in adults. So it's also a subtype that you might see in adults. And the two cases I've shown you were adult patients, young adults. Uh, and then lastly, we have our classical medulloblastoma located along the midline in the fourth ventricle with diffusion restriction. In this case, the medulloblastoma, as we can see on these sagittal and axial T1 weighted images with gadolinium, is very avidly contrast enhancing. And here, this other medulloblastoma contains some areas of enhancement, but for the most part, the tumor is not very uh, enhancing. So the group three medulloblastomas are mainly found in infants and very young children are often associated with stark enhancement. The group four medulloblastomas, which are found in like older toddlers, school age children, show generally a little contrast enhancement. And this is basically the same, but with drawing. So infants and your children. Uh, group three medulloblastoma has the worst prognosis. Group four medulloblastomas have an intermediate prognosis. Uh, then let's summarize what we've seen this far. We've talked about posterior fossa tumors. We talked about thylocytic astrocytomas located in the cerebellar uh, parenchyma, either along the midline and the Burmese or in the hemispheres that have no diffusion restriction. Group three and four medulloblastomas have diffusion restriction and are generally located in the midline in the fourth ventricle. WNT or wingless subtype is located in the region of the cerebellopontine angle, middle cerebellar peduncle, Lushka region. So it's a lateral tumor. 
And then we have the sonic, sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas, which are located in the cerebellar hemisphere. So when should you now consider a medulloblastoma? These were all medulloblastomas, different locations, all have in common diffusion restriction. So consider medulloblastoma and any pediatric fossa posterior tumor with diffusion restriction. Let's move on. This is, oh, well, let's not move on yet. This is another group three medulloblastoma. Notice that the tumor uh, is avidly enhancing. But is that all there is to see in this patient, this very young patient? Well, the tumor is diffusion restricted, but we expect that it's a medulloblastoma. Let's look a little bit closer at the cerebellum, especially here. What's this? We see electromeningeal contrast enhancement, electromeningeal coating of the cerebellar surface, the tectal plate, and in the cerebellar fissures. This is electromeningeal seeding, and it is something you have to look for. Medulloblastomas are associated with a high risk of leptomeningeal seeding, and it is present in 25% of children at diagnosis. So look for it. Don't be satisfied because you figured out that it's probably going to be a medulloblastoma because it's diffusion restrictive and it's a child and so on. Next step, look for leptomeningeal seeding because it can be very discreet. And also suggest to do an MRI of the spine to rule out drop metastasis because these leptomeningeal deposits can uh, drop into the spinal canal and give metastasis as low as the level of the sacrum. So do MRI, full spine. So we see a lot of tumors that look alike on T2-weighted images. Here we see a four-year-old girl. This is a nine-year-old boy. The boy has a medulloblastoma. Yeah, probably a group four, middle-eye tumor, fourth ventricle. What does this girl have? Is this a medulloblastoma as well? Let's take a look at some other sequences. These are the diffusion images, high signal, low on the ADC map. This looks, this is diffusion restriction, right? And there is avid enhancement. This looks like a medulloblastoma. Wouldn't you agree? But it wasn't. It was an atypical teroid, teratoid rhabdoid tumor, ATRT. These tumors can look a lot like medulloblastomas, but they tend to occur in very young children, median age two, three. So I never consider them in children older than four. I'm not saying it's not possible, but you expect them between ages zero and four. Uh, the only thing that could have been uh, more or less characteristic for ATRTs is the presence of these peripheral cysts, which are very extensive uh, or found all along the tumor and are more frequently seen in ATRTs. I don't know why, but it is so. And it's also my experience. So that is maybe a clue you can look for beside the age of the patient. So ATRTs, very malignant tumors, they also belong to the embryonal tumors. So they are related to medulloblastomas. They are found in very young children, about 80% in children uh, are found in children under four years of age with a median age of two to three years. They can be found not only intratentorially, but also in the supratentorial compartment. And the distribution is about 50-50. Uh, so we are going to encounter them later on when we talk about hemispheric tumors. They can look a lot like medulloblastomas. And one of the few clues you can have to suggest it's an ATRT rather than medulloblastoma is radiologically the presence of a lot of small peripheral cysts. Uh, they are heterogeneous, associated with diffusion restriction, and this is also a tumor that is frequently associated with leptomeningeal seeding. So definitely look for leptomeningeal seeding in these patients. So basically, the only clue was the young age of the patient and the presence of the cysts. So when should you consider an ATRT when you are dealing with a pediatric fossa posterior tumor? with diffusion restriction and very young children. So children of age four maximum. Yeah, let's say two to three years. And the only clue 
that mm, you can have radiologically are those small cysts in the periphery. Another tumor type, another lookalike. And this is a very young girl, 32 weeks. And this is a 10 year old boy. The boy has a medulloblastoma. Is this a medulloblastoma as well? Well, it's a very young child, then it would rather be an ATRT, you would say. Uh, and I agree, but it's not that either. So let's compare some sequences. T2 rated images, the tumor looks similar, right? Lab images with gadolinium, we see some heterogeneous enhancement, looks similar, right? Let's move on. Diffusion. The medulloblastoma is associated with diffusion restriction. However, this tumor has no diffusion restriction whatsoever. This was an ependymoma. Uh, I'm going to answer the questions at the end of this session. I see somebody send a, uh, a question through the chat. So questions are for the end of the session. Uh, Dan, so the difference between medulloblastomas and ependymomas is diffusion restriction. Ependymomas generally don't have them unless they are high grade. Uh, and another characteristic, another way to differentiate them is the growth pattern. Medulloblastomas tend to have an infiltrative growth pattern, infiltrating the surrounding cerebellum, potentially the brain stem, while ependymomas have what is called a um, plastic growth pattern. And what is meant by that, these tumors tend to fill the fourth ventricle like a cast, like a cast rather. They extend through the foramen magnum in this case. They can also extend through the foramina of Lushka and Magendi, and they will widen them uh, and grow through them, but not infiltrate the surrounding brain. Uh, let's uh, show you another example. This is the same patient. These are coronal T1 rated images. And we see how beautifully the tumor fills the fourth ventricle, almost like a cast, and extends to the foramen magnum. And this is just a description of the plastic growth pattern. If anyone wants a copy of these slides, just send me a mail, and you can read everything again later on. Uh, not that I have a lot of text on my slides, but the slides are free if you want them. So this is another example and a beautiful example of the plastic growth pattern of ependymomas. We see here a heterogeneous tumor. These tumors are often heterogeneous on T2 rated images and uh, contrast images often contain small cysts, small areas of hemorrhage, small calcifications and so on, making them look heterogeneous. And as a consequence, you think that it's heterogeneous, that looks aggressive with ependymomas or WHO. HO2 tumors. So they are not completely benign, but not highly aggressive either. The tumor has uh, arisen from the inferior medullary velum, so the lower border of the roof of the fourth ventricle. And here we see the tumor extending through the Lushka foramina and the foramen of Magendi. And it has widened them, and the tumor has grown through them. Uh, let's show you another example. No, let's talk a little bit more about ependymomas. They are a group of tumors that can occur anywhere along the axis. They can be found in the posterior fossa, which is the majority, about 60%, but they can also be found supratentorially, about 30%, and even in the spinal cord. And all of these tumors, depending on their location, have differing molecular characteristics. We are now talking about posterior fossa ependymomas, the most frequent types, and these have two subtypes. We have the type B ependymomas, of which I have shown you two examples, and these are the typical tumors found in the roof of the fourth ventricle. They have a better prognosis and are generally found in older children and adults. Then we have the posterior fossa type A ependymomas. These tend to be found in very young children. They are not found centrally or midline in the fourth ventricle, but generally laterally in the region of the Lushka foramen. They tend to have a worse prognosis. And why is that? Well, I'll show you an example. This was an ependymoma. 
These are the two whale images. This is a very young child because these type A cephalomas occur in very young children. And we see that the tumor is not located along the midline, but seems to have an epicenter roughly in the region of the foramen of Lushka. And the tumor has grown along the brain stem and has encased the basal artery. There are a lot of uh, cranial nerves in this region, which are also, no doubt, encased by the tumor. And as a consequence, these tumors are very difficult to operate. And it's very difficult to remove the tumor in its entirety, which is in part responsible for the bad prognosis these tumors have. Uh, here we see that this tumor also has the very characteristic plastic growth pattern of epimdimomas. The tumor extends through the foramen magnum anteriorly of the brain stem. What, what else can we say about ependymomas that I haven't said already? Well, it's a group of tumors with differing locations and differing molecular characteristics. The A type is mainly found in young children, is laterally located in the Lushka foramen, and the B type is found in older children and adults and is a typical midline for ventricle tumor. Look for a plastic growth pattern. If you see diffusion restriction, that's probably a sign that you're dealing with a high-grade ependymoma, an anaplastic ependymoma, because these tumors have no diffusion restriction normally, and leptomeningeal sealing is possible. So you should screen the spine when dealing with an ependymoma, even though leptomeningeal sealing is less frequent than in medulloblastomas. Uh, then let's, uh, when should you consider ependymomas? If you have a fourth ventricle tumor in children or young adults, either located along the midline or located laterally with uh, the epicenter in the Lushka foramen without diffusion restriction and a plastic growth pattern, then you should think about ependymoma. Let's move on to brainstem tumors. Uh, this is a boy, six year old, and this boy has a large T2 hyperintense tumor in the pons. The pons is enlarged, is expansile, and we see that there is engulfment and encasement of the basal artery, which is also displaced by the tumor. The tumor has some contrast enhancing areas. And Oh, I did something wrong. Uh, my apologies. I made some last minute changes and you shouldn't do that. Let's continue with this tumor. My apologies for that. Let's continue with our brainstem tumor. So we have a large mass, hyperintense on T2 and on flare. There are some areas with some diffusion restriction, but for the most part, the tumor is not diffusion restrictive. The tumor has some areas of contrast enhancement, but for the most part, it's not enhancing. So if anyone were to say, this is a brainstem glioma, you are right, it is a brainstem glioma. But I don't like the term glioma because it's very general. We have like over 20 types of gliomas. Which one are we dealing with? And this is one you should know, especially when dealing with pediatric brain tumors. This is a so-called, and the name is difficult if it's the first time uh, you are hearing about this tumor. It's a mouthful. This is an H3 A27 altered diffuse midline glioma. So what does the H3 A27 mean? That refers to a mutation in histone 3 found in these tumors. Uh, WHO4 means it's a very malignant tumor, and the majority of diffuse brainstem gliomas are H3K27 altered midline gliomas. For the rest of the session, I'm just going to refer to them as midline gliomas. So these midline gliomas are mainly found in the brainstem in children, but they can also be found supratentorially but even then, they will be located along the midline. They are mainly found in the thalamus asymmetrically, and they are also described in the cervical spinal cord. But for this topic, pediatric brain tumors, you should mainly, we, should, we will mainly focus on the brainstem location. They have a very bad prognosis. They are like the glioblastomas of children. 
Um, and the typical characteristics are that they are found in the ponds. They are often very large. At the moment, they are diagnosed. And the ponds is completely infiltrated by the tumor, enlarged, and the tumor often engulfs the basilar artery. Generally, contrast enhancement is absent or minimal. So the case I've shown you is already a bit exceptional because most of the tumors don't have that much contrast enhancement. And the same for diffusion restriction. The tumor is generally not diffusion restrictive. So remember that tumor, H3, K27, altered midline glioma. Then another type of brainstem tumors you can, found, uh, you can find in children are these. In this uh, patient, we see a tumoral mass uh, with a lot of contrast enhancement and some central kystic areas or peripheral kystic areas in the middle of oblongata with expansion of the middle of oblongata, some surrounding edema maybe on the T1-weighted images here to see. Uh, seen. And this is a pilocytic astrocytoma of the brainstem. Uh, pilocytic astrocytomas can also occur in the brainstem. And when they occur in the brainstem, they are generally found at the medulla oblongata or the mesencephalon, less in the pons, which is the territory of the diffuse midline glioma. That doesn't mean they can't occur there, uh, pilocytic astrocytomas, but for the most part, medulla oblongata and mesencephalon. Just like in the cerebellum, they can have the appearance of an enhancing nodule with a kist. They can be a completely solid tumor with avid enhancement, or in this case, here we see a sharply circumscribed tumor, uh, hyperintense on flare images with very little, here there is some enhancement on the T1-weighted images with gadolinium. Uh, on the sagittal images, we see that the tumor is located in the middle of longata and uh, causes some exophytic expansion of the middle of longata. So the combination of these findings, the, the fact that the tumor is very sharply demarcated and can be uh, very sharply delineated from the rest of the brain stem combined with the location in the middle of longata should favor a pilocytic astrocytoma as your differential diagnosis or first differential diagnostic suggestion for this tumor. So what can we say about pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem? Well, nothing I haven't said already. They are often found in the medulla oblongata. When they occur in the medulla oblongata, they can extend into the upper cervical cord. They often have some exophytic growth, and they have often very sharp borders, as we can see here, because they have no infiltrative growth pattern. Um, pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem are often associated with neurofibromatosis type 1, or let's turn it around, neurofibromatosis type 1 can be associated with pilocytic astrocytomas in the brainstem. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is a genetic disorder uh, caused by a mutation and uh, the gene um, coding for neurofibrin 1, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And these patients can have patchy areas of increased signal on T2 and flare images in the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, cerebellum rather, brainstem, uh, hippocampi, and these are so-called UBOs, unidentif unidentified bright objects or phases focal areas of increased signal intensities. These are not humors. It's just something we often see in the brain of these patients. And when it comes to tumors, a tumor that is uh, associated with neurofibromatosis type 1 is the opticus glioma. And we see here an expansion of the right optic nerve due to the presence of an opticus glioma. And here we see a sharply demarcated, completely enhancing small nodule in the superior pons. I didn't say they can't occur in the pons. This one is in the pons. And this was a very small pilocytic astrocytoma in a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1. And this is another example. We see here the UBOs or phases in the basal ganglia, the thalami, even in the fornix, as we can see here on these flare images. And then we see in the mesencephalon on T1 with gadolinium, 
a kistic lesion, a kistic tumor with enhancement of the kist wall. This was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Now, what is this? This is a patient with a T2 hyperintense tumor located laterally on the right side in the medulla oblongata. So, medulla oblongata, it's a child with pilocytic astrocytoma, right? But when we look on the T2 rated images, can't really say that the tumor has a very sharp borders. The tumor looks to be a little bit infiltrative. Maybe that's our impression, but we also have that impression here on the sagittal T1 rated images. The tumor shows little contrast enhancement, but it has an enhancing component. I didn't know what this was. So I said, well, the most frequent brain stem tumors in children are either diffuse midline gliomas, very bad prognosis, infiltrative, located mainly in the pons. This looks like an infiltrative tumor, but it's not located in the pons, but you know, nothing as 100% in the radiology. So I said, maybe it's still a diffuse midline glioma. And my second suggestion was, or it's a completely benign tumor, a pilocytic astrocytoma, even though I find the tumor a little bit infiltrative, infiltrative for a pilocytic astrocytoma. The pathologist solved the case. This was a low-grade pediatric glioma, MAPK pathway altered. You can forget that already um, because this is a separate tumor type that was introduced in the WHO classification only recently in 2021. MAPK pathway altered refers to the location of the genetic defects in these tumors, which are located in a pathway that is responsible for um, the control of um, genes that code for cellular growth and proliferation. Um, these tumors have no IDH mutations, which is the molecular characteristic of adult type diffuse gliomas. And they are H3 wild type and H3 mutations are the hallmark of uh, high grade pediatric gliomas like H3K27, altered midline gliomas. So they have no signs of malignancies and they are grade one or two, but is not yet determined by the WHO. This was a pathological diagnosis. Even in retrospect, I don't think I would have suggested this. This is way too specific for me. And the problem with these tumors that have only recently been introduced in the WHO classification is that, well, nobody can really tell you what the typical imaging features are because we still have to research that and they still have to be determined. So I'm only showing you that to show you that there is more than diffuse midline gliomas and there is more than pedocytic astrocytoma. So keep an open mind when you see something that doesn't really fit either one of those. And pectal gliomas apparently or often uh, MAPKK out of pediatric low grade glioma, something I didn't know till I was preparing this presentation. And the other tumor type mainly found in the tactile plate as the pilocytic astrocytoma. Let's move on. Another patient with neurofibromatosis type 1 has some new bones in the basal ganglia. My apologies. And when we look at the sagittal images, we already see on the axial images that the patient has a hydrocephalus. And we see a small web or a stenosis in the cerebral aqueduct. So what did we suggest? Logically, I would say this is an aqueductal web, and this is probably a congenital aqueductal stenosis causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Only for the patient to receive another MRI two years later, and this lesion had grown. So this was a very small tectal glioma. The patient had neurofibromatosis type 1, so maybe, and in retrospect, we could say, well, hmm, this signal is maybe a little bit increased. You know, you could maybe, in retrospect, see a small nodule here on the T2-rated images. Um, but uh, keep it in mind, tectal gliomas, which are often pilocytic astrocytomas or MAPK, or the pathway low-grade gliomas. So let's summarize. When dealing with a brainstem tumor in a child, the two main differential diagnoses to consider are 
midline tumors. So the H3K27 old midline glioma, which is classically located in the pons, very large pneumonia diagnosis and causes expansion of the pons and encasement of the basilar artery. And then we have the very benign photocytic astrocytomas, which are sharply demarcated, can be completely enhancing, not enhancing, uh, kissed with an enhancing nodule, and so on, or mainly found in the mesencephalon and the medulla oblongata and associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, so that concludes the first part, and I'm already going to summarize because I'm, I told so much already. So we started with three questions. How old is the patient? Where is the tumor located? What is the patient? What does the tumor look like? When it comes to the age of the patient, pyrocytic astrocytomas can be found at all ages, but mainly in school-age kids and older teenagers, like uh, 50, 15 years old. Metalloblastomas can also be seen at all ages, but mainly in toddlers and school age, uh, school age kids with a median age for metalloblastoma six years old. ATRTs are mainly found in very young children, like maximum four years of age, the majority like two to three years of age. Uh, and then we have the ependymomas, and we have two subtypes, the type A, located in the Lushka foramen, which are mainly found in very young children, median age, two to three years. And we have the type B, found in older children and adults. So that's for the age. When it comes to location, when dealing with a tumor in the cerebellar hemispheres, think pilocytic astrocytoma or sonic, sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. When dealing with a midline tumor in the fourth ventricle, think medulloblastoma can be any subtype really, uh, ATRT or ependymoma. And when dealing with a brainstem tumor, consider the possibility of a diffuse midline glioma that's in the pons and very large and infiltrative or a pedocytic astrocytoma when it's a more focal, sharply delineated tumor in the mesencephalon or the medulla oblongata. And this is the same, but on an anatomical image, we have pilocytic astrocytoma, SHH medulloblastoma, and also HTRTs, because these can also occur in the cerebellar hemispheres. We have in the fourth ventricle medulloblastoma, HTRT, and type B ependymomas. We have brainstem gliomas. And here I included tumors located in the region of the Lushka foramen, which can be wingless type medulloblastoma, HDRTs, and type A ependymomas. And then the last question, what does a tumor look like? There are some characteristics that can be very helpful for pilocytic astrocytomas when you have a pistous nodule appearance that is an almost an odd mini case, but they don't all look like that. When you see diffusion restriction, it's probably a medulloblastoma or an ATRT, or maybe an anaplastic ependymoma, but uh, that would be the last of my considerations. And lastly, when you see a tumor with a plastic growth pattern, think ependymoma. Now let's move on with uh, supratentorial tumors. I'm now going to talk about midline tumors. So midline tumors can arise from the pituitary stalk, the optic chiasm, or the hypothalamus, or from the pineal gland. And the differential diagnosis is limited. So for radiologists, these are tumors we can generally say something about. We can often give very good suggestions. Uh, pineal gland tumors include germ cell tumors and pineal blastomas. And when it comes to the tumors located in the supracellar region, we have gliomas, craniopharyngiomas, and germ cell tumors. Let's start with an example. We see here a young child with a very large lobulated mass, uh, maybe a small kistic component here, but for the majority, for the most part, this is a solid tumor, avidly enhancing, somewhat heterogeneous, anti two weighted images, and the tumor is located in the supracellar region, has not arisen from the cella. We can see a normal pituitary here. This was an optic pathway glioma, or academic discussion, is it a hypothalamic glioma? Where did the tumor originate originally? 
impossible to say now. Some call it an optical chiasmatic hypothalamic glioma. Then you have all your basic covered, yeah? optic pathways, uh, optic chiasm, hypothalamus, it's all in there. These are pilocytic astrocytomas. These are low grade tumors. Uh, but when they reach a size like this, and due to their location close to cranial nerves, close to vascular structures, not easy to completely resect surgically. Uh, another example of an optic pathway glioma is a glioma strictly limited to the optic nerve. In that case, we can call it an optic glioma, not an optical chiasmatic hypothalamic. And these are very strongly associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. They occur in about 20% of patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. And they look like an expansion of the optic nerve. In this case, without enhancement, these are T1 rated images with gadolinium, uh, but they can enhance as well. Uh, this is the same patient as we saw uh, just yet. And in this patient, the tumor was enhancing. So they can enhance, they cannot enhance. I already told you enhancement is overrated in brain tumors when it comes to differential diagnosis. And this was a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1. We see all these small uboes in the basal ganglia. And we see them better on these magnified images. Uh, what can I tell you about optic pathway gliomas? Well, they are gliomas of the optic nerve, the chiasm, or the optic radiation. So, evidently, when they are found supracellularly, it's basically impossible to say if they really originated from the optic chiasm or from the hypothalamus, but the distinction is a bit academic, I believe. And you can call them hypothalamic optical chiasmatic gliomas, and you have all your basic all your bases covered. They are pilocytic astrocytomas, WHO1 tumors, and they are associated with neurofibromatosis type 1, especially when the tumor is located only in the optic nerve. So these tumors, this association is less strong for these supracellular tumors. The association is especially for tumors strictly in the orbital segment, so to say, of the optic nerve. Um, and when you see these bilaterally, bilateral optic nerve gliomas, that's basically pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis type 1. Let's return to the chiasmatic hypothalamic gliomas. Just three examples. Make a mental blueprint out of it. If you see a tumor like this in a child, you should always consider a chiasmatic hypothalamic glioma. And when you put your finger in the center of the tumor, what do you have there? Well, impossible to see it now because the tumor has infiltrated everything. But here we would find the region of the hypothalamus and the optic chiasm. The tumor, in this case, clearly did not arise from the pituitary star. The pituitary star can be seen here. Here, it's impossible to say because the tumor has extended all the way into the cella but based on the fact that the epicenter of the tumor is located supracellularly, it does not seem that the tumor has uh, arose primarily out of the cell. Uh, the main differential diagnosis of these tumors is with craniopharyngiomas. I will not talk about them in great detail because I already addressed them in the last session. Just for uh, the sake of this presentation, in children, we have the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma subtype, which are characterized by large kists and coarse calcifications. On MRI, these calcifications are not always clearly visible. Here we see a predominantly kistic tumor, some enhancement of the kist wall, with some not enhancing components located centrally in the tumor. And when we look at the CT images, we see that the tumor is composed of a large kist and contains large calcifications. When you see this combination, your first suggestion should always be craniopharyngioma, more specifically adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma, because kists and calcifications are present in like 90% of these tumors. 
On the CT images, we see some calcifications in the cyst wall, and we see that the contents of the cysts, that the content of the cyst is hyper intense on flare and T1 images because it is filled with proteinaceous fluid. Um, and this is just comparing the appearance of a craniopharyngioma, which in this case has extended into the cella tersica. They don't always do that. They can also stay limited to the supracellar region. And here we have a chiasmatic hypothalamic glioma. This is a predominantly kystic tumor. This is a predominantly solid tumor. Let's move on to another type of midline tumors. In this case, we see a large tumoral mass in the pineal gland. Do we see something else? Now, we, that's uh, one of the biases in radiology. When you see something, you have like the satiety of search and you stop looking for other things, but there is another tumor present in this patient. Let's take a closer look to the region of the, of the pituitary stalk. The pituitary stalk is thickened as is the bottom of the third ventricle and the region of the infundibular recess. This is abnormal. This patient has two tumors, one in the pituitary stalk and the hypothalamic region, and one located in the pineal gland. This was a bifocal germ cell tumor, and I will tell you more about that uh, in a minute. Um, okay, so these patients can present with two main symptom complexes, depending on what kind of tumor they have exactly. If they have a very large pineal gland uh, tumor, they will present with signs of mass effect, a parino syndrome due to compression of the tectal plate or an obstructive hydrocephalus. When they predominantly have this, uh, this supracellar germinoma, they will present with endocrinological symptoms like diabetes insipidus uh, or pan hypopituitarism uh, or with a combination of both. They, I'm now showing you bifocal tumors, but bifocality is seen in about 25% of these tumors. So it can be or will be a solitary tumor in either the supracellar region or the pineal gland region in about three quarters of these patients. These are germ cell tumors. How do you get germ cell tumors in your head? Because germ cells, it, it seems to imply that you have sperm or eggs in your brain, because how else could you get a germ cell tumor in your brain? It has to do with embryology. Embryologically, the primordial germ cells, so the precursor cells of the germ cells, or develop in the old sac and then migrate to the genital regions where they will be incorporated in the future gonads and they migrate along sympathetic nerve fibers. Normally, when they reach the genital ridge, this migration has to stop, but in some cases it goes wrong and these cells migrate further along the sympathetic trunk, which is located along the midline. And depending on where these tumors end up, you can get germ cell tumors along various midline organs. You can have them in the mediastinum, you can have them in the retroperitoneum, and you can even have them in the midline structures of your head. So it's always nice to understand how these things are possible. There are a lot of different types of germ cell tumors. There's not just one type. For the sake of this presentation, I will not go into this slide in detail. Just remember that about 60 to 80% of germ cell tumors, intracranial germ cell tumors in children are so-called germinomas, which are derived from the primordial germ cells. Uh, and everything that is on this slide has already been said, I believe. These are midline tumors, can be multifocal, located in the pineal gland, the supracellar region, or in about five, maybe 10% of cases, they can be found in the basal ganglia region, but that is exceptional or less, very less frequent. They are classic tumors of childhood and adolescence. 90% are found in patients under 20 years of age, 
and you're frequently associated with leptomeningeal dissemination. So when you see them, do an MRI of the full spine and scrutinize your images for leptomeningeal deposits. But the prognosis is good. They have a five-year survival rate of 90% and a good response to radiation therapy. This is another example of a bifocal germ cell tumor. And in this case, we see two rather small tumors. Maybe if, it's, if it weren't for this supracellar tumor, maybe you would have missed this small pineal gland tumor. So uh, when you see a tumor and you think it could be a germ cell tumor, always look for a second location. Always figure out if it's a bifocal tumor or not. This is another example. Here we see clearly a pineal gland tumor, right? But take a look at the pituitary star. It's too thick. It's not very, very thick. It's not even nodular. It's too thick. And this was also a tumor location. This is another example of a bifocal germ cell tumor. Uh, this patient probably presented with diabetes insipidus because when we look at the sagittal T1 rated images uh, without enhancement or without uh, gadolinium, we see that uh, normally T1 hyperintense spot of the posterior pituitary is missing. So um, vasopressin does not reach and accumulate in the pituitary bright spot. When you see this in a child, diabetes insipidus can be an autoimmune disorder, can be idiopathic, but when you see it in a, in a child, we should also consider the possibility of an underlying germ cell tumor. And these tumors can even remain occult. So we have to do radiolog radiological follow-up. This is another example of a germ cell tumor, this time in the pineal gland. And we see sugar coating or leptomeningeal coating of the brainstem surface. This was leptomeningeal dissemination. Always look for it in germ cell tumors. And this is an, uh, a more exceptional case we nicely see that we are once again dealing with a bifocal germ cell tumor with a large supracellar tumor and also an enlarged pineal gland. So this is also a tumor location. And this patient has subependinal spread. Subependinal spread is less frequent, considerably less frequent than leptomeningeal dissemination, but you should, should still look for it. We see here thick micronodular enhancements along the frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle, and also here located along the border of the septum pellucidum. Uh, this was a four-year-old uh, child who presented with precocious puberty and elevated HCG, uh, beta HCG. Uh, classical germinomas are not associated with elevated alpha protoprotein or alpha uh, or beta HCG. They are generally negative uh, on um, hormonal or molecular markers. So this was a non-germinoma, but nothing was seen on the original MRI performed at age four. At age 10, however, we see a clear thickening of the tuber cinereum, so the bottom of the third ventricle, this is a component of the hypothalamus, and the eminentia mediana of the pituitary stalk. This was a non germinoma, uh, which is basically a way of saying well, it's a germ cell tumor, but it wasn't a germinoma, it was, it was one of those other guys. Uh, and this illustrates that when you suspect a germ cell tumor in a child, you should follow it up in time. How long is difficult to say. I believe that this was an exceptional case. A tumor only becoming apparent on imaging six years later is exceptional. Uh, I've read some studies who suggest follow up three years. If you have a child with endocrinological abnormalities like diabetes and sipilis, that could be caused by an occult germinoma. But I have the impression that there are no clear guidelines. So it's something you have to discuss with your pediatric endocrinologist. The main differential diagnosis for a large tumor in the pineal gland in a child would be with a primary pineal gland tumor. A primary pineal gland tumor is a tumor that has arisen out of the pinealocytes, the primary cells of the pineal gland. It's a tumor, it's a type of tumor that can be found in children and in adults. 
And it can be very benign, like a pineocytoma. It can be very aggressive, like a pineoblastoma. And it can be somewhere in between, like the pineal tumor of intermediary differentiation, which is just a mouthful of saying it's a tumor of the pineal gland, somewhere in between, between very benign and very aggressive. So these tumors, this is an example of a pineoblastoma. A pineoblastoma tends to be very dense on CT. We see a very dense mass on these unenhanced CT images, and the tumor clearly causes an obstructive hydrocephalus. We see a clear expansion of the supratentorial ventricular system. My apologies. On MRI, we see that the tumor is enhancing, and we also see that the tumor is associated with diffusion restriction. These are signs of a hypercellular tumor. The pineoblastoma is part of the small blue round cell tumors. So it's a tumor composed of a lot of very small cells, which causes uh, an increased density on CT and diffusion restriction on MRI. Pineoblastomas are very aggressive tumors, so they are often associated with leptomeningeal seeding. We see here leptomeningeal coating of the upper uh, cerebellar fissures. We see some leptomeningeal coating along the cervical spinal cord, micronodular, and we see very extensive nodular deposits in the lumbar spinal canal and in the sacrum, which illustrates why you should do an MRI full spine of the entire spine. So always include the sacrum as well as to not miss drop metastasis. Can we differentiate pineoblastomas from germ cell tumors on MRI? It's difficult. This is a germ cell tumor. We see a tumor that is hyperintense on T2. It is slightly increased in signal the diffusion weighted images, is enhancing, and contains a coarse calcification seen here on these T2 star images. Um, the differentiation can be difficult because in the studies that have been published on this subject, the conclusion is the only thing you can say as they tend to have less diffusion restriction of pineoblastomas and are found in younger patients. And that's what you have to work with. So it can be a bit difficult or it's not always clear cut. What can be useful is CT uh, for the differential diagnosis because germ cell tumors, the calcifications tend to be located eccentrically in the tumor while in pineoblastomas and other primary pineal gland tumors, the tumors tend to be more uh, peripherally scattered. So as if central classifications have blown up and scattered in the tumor. So it's not 100% reliable. I have to say, I sometimes use it when I'm dealing with a tumor and I just can't make up my mind to drug cell tumor or pineoblastoma. Then I look at CT images if they are available, and it will make me go more one way or another, but it's definitely not 100% reliable. So you can use it to you know, shift your possibilities or your degree of certainty. Let's summarize the midline tumors. We have seen pineal gland tumors. These can be germ cell tumors or primary pineal tumors, and we mainly discussed the and we mainly discussed the very aggressive pineoblastoma in this session. Uh, they can be located in the supracellular region, and then they originate in the region of the hypothalamus or the optic chiasm. They are hypothalamic optico, no, optico chiasmatic hypothalamic gliomas, a whole mouthful, just call them gliomas. Uh, and when they arise from the pituitary stalk, they are either craniopharyngiomas or germ cell tumors. And let's move on to the last part of today, supratentorial pediatric brain tumors, hemispheric tumors. So we just talked supratentorial midline tumors, now we're talking about hemispheric tumors. These are more difficult because they are quite diverse. When, it's, when we're talking about posterior fossa tumors and midline tumors, you have a limited group of tumors and a lot of reliable imaging characteristics to help you differentiate them. That is less the case when talking about hemispheric supratentorial tumors. 
I am going to talk about embryonal tumors, diffuse pediatric gliomas, supratemporal ependymomas, and even about pilocytic astrocytomas, although they are very infrequent supratemporally in children. Let's start with this two-year-old child. This child has a very aggressive appearing mass located uh, in the right hemisphere, extending in the ventricular system. It contains large areas of necrosis, more clearly seen here on these T1 weighted images after gadolinium. And we see that the solid enhancing component of the tumor is associated with diffusion restriction. Diffusion restriction, you should think embryonal, and this is an atypical therapeutic rhabdoid tumor. I told you before, we are going to encounter them again when talking about hemispheric tumors, and the distribution is about 50% intratentorial, 50% supratentorial. And once again, the main clue to the diagnosis is very young age and a tumor with diffusion restriction. So this is just a comparison. This was our, uh, this is a child with a subtentorial ATRT. This is a child with a posterior fossa ATRT, both very young children and both tumors with diffusion restriction. So you should consider ATRT in any mass, either supra or intratentorially, any young child if it has diffusion restriction. Let's move on. Still the same child. Let's examine it a bit closer. ATRTs are often associated with leptomeningeal seeding, but in this case, the tumor has grown into the ventricles and we see clear leptomeningeal seeding. Um, we see clear ventricular deposits. So there is spread of the tumor in the ventricular system. And that's not all. This is an MRI of the spine. And we clearly see contrast enhancing nodules and some leptomeningeal enhancement in the lumbar spinal canal. So, this is leptomeningeal and intraventricular spread of ATRT. This is a child of two years and six months. And what do we see? We see a very large intraventricular mass located along the midline, extending towards the left or extending in the left cerebral hemisphere. The tumor has large kistic components, but the solid component of the tumor is diffu diffusion restrictive, as we can see here. And on these T1-weighted images without gadolinium, we see very little contrast enhancement, a little bit here, a little bit here, but that's about it. This is an embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosettes. What is that? That is also a type of embryonal tumor uh, recently incorporated in the WHO 2021 criteria, uh, and it belongs to the embryonal tumor, just like medulloblastoma and ATRTs. And recurring here is the presence of diffusion restriction. This is another example. Once again, intraventricular. I believe this is coincidental because it's not that these tumors tend to be located in the ventricles. They arise from the brain parenchyma or from brain tissue, so it's, I believe, coincidental that I'm showing you two intraventricularly located tumors after another. Um, this tumor was not otherwise specified because it's an old case. And embryonal tumors, the molecular features have only in the last couple of years been well characterized. So this case is maybe 10 years old, and I don't think it was possible to diagnose the tumor then as an embryonal tumor with multilayered rosettes. But I believe it could be one because what embryonal tumors with multilayered rosettes often have is sharp borders, which is a bit strange because it's a very aggressive tumor. Nonetheless, they often have sharp borders, very little pyrilesional edema, also not something we expect from a very malignant tumor. Uh, there is, of course, the diffusion restriction and these tumors often have very little or patchy enhancement or sometimes no enhancement at all. So also this last thing is not something we expect from a very malignant tumor, but I already told you contrast is overrated when it comes to differential diagnosis of brain tumors. Um, these are all patients with embryonal tumors. You have several types. 
Um, and most of these tumors, most of these cases come from an age where these subtypes weren't really known yet. Um, so the subtype is not that important. What is important is that you should consider the possibility of an embryonal tumor other than ATRT and any superfemtorial tumor with diffusion restriction and very young children, children age four maximum. Let's move on. And I'm going to skip this. These are all the subtypes, but that's not that important. I believe as a radiologist, it's important to have an, a notion of the most frequent ones of these types, the ATRT and embryonal tumor multilayer rosettes. But the problem is these tumors have only recently been incorporated in the WHO 2001 classification. They are rare. So you don't have large case series showing you typical imaging features. Just keep in mind diffusion restriction, supratentorial young child, it's an embryonal tumor probably. This is an eight-year-old girl. We see a large mass in the right parietal lobe. It's predominantly solid. There are some cysts seen uh, here in the periphery of the tumor. Also a lot of small cysts or areas of necrosis in the tumor. It's a very heterogeneous tumor surrounded by edema. What could this be? Oh my God, diffusion restriction. This is going to be an embryonal tumor. Well, no, the child, it's a girl of eight years old. Embryonal tumors we mainly encounter in very young children. So no, I don't believe this is an embryonal tumor. This was an anaplastic ependymoma. And this is a difficult one because anaplastic ependymomas have no characteristic imaging features. I can't tell you that's what that tumor looks like. The tumor has enhancement, but what does that mean? It just means that the tumor has immature vessels with a deficient blood-brain barrier. The tumor has diffusion restriction. Okay, it means it's a tumor with a high cell density, and the tumor has some hyperperfusion, which just means that there is an increased microvascular density and some new angiogenes in the tumor. These are all signs combined, which point to a higher grade tumor, but are not specific to give an exact diagnosis. If you would see this tumor in an adult, you would say glioblastoma. And that is basically what I keep in mind when I make the suggestion of a supratemptorial anaplastic ependymoma. Would I have suggested glioblastoma if this would have been an adult? Um, it's not an adult. It's a child, eight years old. So... It's uh, not a glioblastoma, it's not an embryonal tumor, so it's possibly an anaplastic ependymoma. And as I said, there are very little characteristic MRI features. You are dealing with a very heterogeneous tumor, often with cysts and calcification, but that's not very helpful. Supratemptorial ependymomas make up about 30% of the ependymoma family and have different molecular characteristics from the posterior fossa ependymomas. Uh, they are associated with mutations in YAP1 and ZFTA, but you can already forget that. Um, you have to, yeah, the, these subtypes have different profiles, uh, with YAP1 mainly occurring in very young children, and the ZFTA is the most frequent one, mainly occurring in children somewhat older. So this is another tumor, a hemispheric tumor, this time located in the left occipital lobe, a 15-year-old boy. It is a hemorrhagic tumor. Look at the T2 star images, and the presence of hemorrhage um, confounds the image. We cannot reliably interpret the diffusion-weighted images. Maybe there are some diffusion-restrictive components here located, but you know, with all the hemorrhage, it's hard to say. It looks as if there is some cortical infiltration here, so you're thinking that this could be some kind of diffuse glial tumor. And when we look at the T1-weighted images, these are also difficult to interpret. These are the unenhanced T1-weighted images. We see a lot of high T1 components due to the presence of hemorrhage, and that makes the T1-weighted images with gadolinium difficult to interpret. We don't see clear enhancement. Most of what we see is probably hemorrhage. Once again, if this had been an adult, we probably would have said it's a high-grade glial tumor, right? Like glioblastoma. 
But glioblastomas or oligodendrogliomas, these do not occur in children or are very exceptional. I'm sure you'll find cases, but are then very exceptional. This was an H3 G34 mute diffuse hemispheric glioma. A mouthful. Do you have to remember that? No, because well, you, you, you may remember it, you know, uh, the more you know, the better. You can never know too much. But it's once again a tumor that has no clear defining characteristics. Once again, if you see a tumor and you think, well, if this were an adult, I would have said it's a high-grade glial tumor. Well, then, and if the patient is a child, then maybe it's an H3 G34 mutant diffuse hemispheric glioma. So when it comes to the diffuse pediatric gliomas, when it comes to the high-grade subtypes, we already discussed the H3K27 ultra diffuse midline types, which are mainly found in the brainstem. Then we have the H3 G34 mutant types, which are found in the hemispheres. So that's the way to remember them. H3, H3, it's a recurring finding. It's no coincidence. Then we have a third subtype, which is called H3 wild type, which means we don't find the mutations associated with these midline gliomas or hemispheric gliomas here. And your uh, IDH wild type, which means we don't find the IDH mutation we typically see in adult diffuse gliomas. So basically, this type is just a type that molecularly does not belong to these two and does not belong to the adult types. So it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion, although that's not completely correct, but I can go into that due to time constraints. And the last type is the infant type hemispheric glioma. Difficult, right? But I, I hope you can uh, summarize everything at the end and it will be a bit easier. This is a patient with an asymmetric bithalamic glial appealing tumor. It looks like an infiltrative tumor, unshot borders, no enhancement, no diffusion restriction. What is this? And also extension into the mesencephalon. This was also an H3K27 diffuse midline glioma. I told you in young children, they mainly occur in the brainstem. In older children, also in adults, we can find them supratentorially with a long midline structures like the thalamus. Just like their counterpart in the brainstem, there is often no enhancement and no diffusion restriction. This is another classic from pediatric neuroradiology, the bithalamic glioma. H3K27 midline gliomas are unsharp and are asymmetrical. These are something else. I can't tell you what it is pathologically. It did not have an H3 mutation, so it's a diffuse glial tumor, not otherwise specified, but definitely it was an H3K27 midline glioma. And if you see a tumor like this, it won't be H3K27. They are not that nicely symmetrical. Last subtype of diffuse high-grade glial tumors in children, the infantile hemispheric glioma. I have never seen one, so I took uh, one from the medical literature. And basically, it's very, very easy. When should you consider this one? When you are dealing with a very large and very heterogeneous tumor in a newborn, in an infant, a child less than one year of age, which almost completely encompasses an entire hemisphere, then you might consider infantile hemispheric glioma. And this is the last case, I believe, from this tumor group. This is a child nine weeks old, seems to have a large cyst here in the right occipital region, also clearly seen here, a lot of surrounding edema. And on the T1 weighted images, after gadolinium, we see of enhancement. What was this? This is also a very rare tumor. This was a desmoplastic infantile astrocytoma or ganglioglioma. Now, this is a very rare tumor, but it's, if you know it exists and you know what it looks like, it's not a hard to diagnose. It looks very aggressive, but luckily it's very benign. 
It's a tumor of very young children. Children are generally less than two years of age, and they present with an increasing head circumference, either because of the tumor or because of the hydrocephalus that develops. The tumor consists of a very large predominantly kystic mass, which tends to have a very large apathy enhancing component, which has a broad dural surface and abuts the meninges. These tumors are benign, so the prognosis is good when total resection is possible. And to finish, phyllocytic astrocytomas can also occur supratentorially, and then they can have the appearance we also find in the cerebellar hemispheres of a large enhancing nodule with a cyst. Notice that the cyst wall here is enhancing, here it isn't. So both are possible. And we mainly find those in adults rather than in children. So let's summarize. If you see a uh, supertentorial mass, a very young children with diffusion restriction think embryonal, ATRT, embryonal tumor with multilayered rosettes, one of those other guys which are impossible to remember, just think embryonal tumor. And somewhat older children, when you see a tumor, a hemispheric mass, and your first idea is, wow, this is a glioblastoma. Oh, wait, it can't be a glioblastoma because it's a child. Then you should consider the possibility of a supertentorial ependymoma or a diffuse pediatric high grade glioma, like the H3G34 mid um, hemispheric diffuse glioma. In very young children, like infants, first years of age, if you see a large hemispheric tumor and it has a very large fist and an enhancing component with a broad meningeal surface, think infantile, no, sorry, desmoplastic infantile ganglioglioma or astrocytoma. If the tumor looks very aggressive and almost completely encompasses a hemisphere, think infantile hemispheric glioma, also very rare, by the way. And then lastly, H3K27 altered midline gliomas can occur supratentorially in older children and adults. And think about them when you're dealing with an asymmetrical thalamic uh, tumor. It can be unilateral or bilateral, but if it's bilateral, it's going to be asymmetric. Generally, no diffusion restriction, no enhancement. Pulsitic astrocytomas, they are possible. So if you see the classical nodule with kist, even if it's located supratentorially, they can occur there, especially in adults, so it's possible. Keep it in mind. Total summary, we've seen a lot. We've seen infratentorial tumors, pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ATRT, ependymoma, H3K27 midline gliomas in the pons, pilocytic astrocytomas in the mesencephalon and middle oblongata, germ cell tumors and pineoblastomas in the pineal glands, then we have gliomas, craniopharyngiomas, and germ cell tumors in the supracellar region. And we ended with a quite difficult topic, I find personally, hemispheric pediatric tumors, which include embryonal tumors, diffuse pediatric gliomas, and we only discussed the high-grade ones, and supratentorial ependymomas. So um, that was it. Uh, I would like to recommend the YouTube channel of Felici Darko, a pediatric neuroradiologist uh, working in London, who has some excellent videos and also has one uh, on the molecular uh, characteristics uh, of pediatric brain tumors. So uh, look it up. But also look up my own YouTube channel, of course, because I want to get to a thousand abonnees. So if you're not a member yet, please become a member and give me lots of likes because I'm in it for the likes. And if you have any questions, feedback, comments, and so on, just send me a mail, svenpenbekezer at gmail.com or, or neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. So if there are any questions, uh, please, you can send them through the chat and I will unmute you all. Let me find out how. Let me check. Uh, I have to stop sharing my screen.
So I cannot unmute you. I don't see how. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, you are now unmuted. So if you want, you can ask questions. And if there are no questions, well, then. There is one question. I have a question about diffusion restriction. Do I consider diffusion restriction even if I see only dark and therefore think of a medulloblastoma? Um, it's not completely clear to me, but to talk about diffusion restriction, you have to have two things. The, the lesion has to be hyper intense on your uh, diffusion weighted images. And more importantly, it has to be black on the ADC map. So if a tumor is black on the ADC map, that's diffusion restriction. And if the tumor is located somewhere in the fossa posterior, medulloblastoma should be one of your differential or should be your first differential diagnostic consideration. So I believe there are no further questions. Well, then we are going to, oh, yes. non radiology Diabetes insipidus is now called arginine vasopressin deficiency or argin. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you very much for this useful comment. Uh, I am not going to the ENR Congress in Vienna. Uh, and that's it for the questions, I believe. So then we are going to finish here. The next session will be in three weeks from now, not two weeks, but three weeks and will be more practice-based. It will be a shared session, me and Dr. Idil Gunestatar of Saint-Luc in Brussels. And I'm going to talk about uh, intraventricular tumors, cerebellar tumors, type that we haven't seen yet, and tumors associated with chronic epilepsy or long-standing epilepsy. And I don't know what Dr. Idil Gunestatar is going to talk about yet. So see you then.